Utopia, Ltd. Or, The Flowers of Progress, is a Savoy opera, with music by Arthur Sullivan and libretto by W.S. Gilbert. It was the second to last of Gilbert and Sullivan's 14 collaborations, premiering on October 7, 1893 for a run of 245 performances. It did not achieve the success of most of their earlier productions. Gilbert's libretto satirizes limited liability companies, and particularly the idea that a bankrupt company could leave creditors unpaid without any liability on the part of its owners. It also lampoons the Joint Stock Company Act by imagining the absurd convergence of natural persons with legal commercial entities under the limited company's laws. In addition, it mocks the conceits of the late 19th century British Empire and several of the nation's beloved institutions. In mocking the adoption by a barbaric country of the cultural values of an advanced nation, it takes a tilt at the cultural aspects of imperialism. The libretto was criticized as too long and rambling by some critics and later commentators, and several subplots introduced in Act I are never resolved. Utopia is performed much less frequently than most other Gilbert and Sullivan operas. It can be expensive to produce requiring a large principal cast and two costumes for most of the performers. The subject matter and characters, including the specific government offices, are obscure for modern audiences, although its themes of corporatization of public institutions and scandal in the British royal family are evergreen. And although it contains some fine music, it perhaps has less than Sullivan's usual quota of unforgettable tunes. Bernard Shaw, however, wrote in his highly favorable October 1893 review of the show in the world, I enjoyed the score of Utopia more than that of any of the previous Savoy operas. Background In 1890, during the production of Gilbert and Sullivan's previous opera, The Gondoliers, Gilbert became embroiled in a legal dispute with their producer, Richard Doyley Cart, over the cost of a new carpet for the Savoy Theatre Euro, and, more generally, over the accounting for expenses over the course of their long partnership. Sullivan sided with Cart and was made a defendant in the case, and the partnership disbanded. Gilbert vowed to write no more operas for the Savoy, and after the gondoliers closed in 1891, Gilbert withdrew the performance rights to his library. It was not until October 1891, after conversations with their publisher Tom Chappell, that Gilbert and Sullivan reconciled. After fulfilling their respective open commitments Gilbert and Sullivan were able to plan to renew their collaboration on a new opera, Utopia, Ltd. The lawsuit, however, had left Gilbert and Sullivan somewhat embittered, and their last two works together suffered from a less collegial working relationship than the two men had typically enjoyed while writing earlier operas. Equals Genesis of the Opera Equals, in November 1892 after lengthy and delicate discussions over the financial arrangements for a new opera, Gilbert, Sullivan and Cart were able to reach an agreement and set to work on the new opera. On January 27, 1893, Gilbert read the plot outline for the libretto to Sullivan, and by July, he was finished with the libretto. Gilbert suffered from bad gout throughout the summer and autumn of 1893 and had to attend rehearsals in a wheelchair. Gilbert and Sullivan disagreed on several matters, including the character of Lady Sophie, and Sullivan found some of Gilbert's lyrics difficult to set. Their lack of the cohesion during the writing and editing of Utopia was in marked contrast with what Sullivan called the oneness of their previous collaborations since trial by jury in 1875. Nonetheless, Sullivan completed the setting of Gilbert's first act within a month and received particular congratulations from his collaborator for the finale, which Gilbert considered the best Sullivan had composed. For Utopia, the creators engaged Hawes Craven to design the sets, which were much praised. Craven was the designer for Henry Irving's spectacular Shakespeare productions at the Lyceum Theatre. Percy Anderson designed the costumes. The scenery, Properties and costumes cost an unprecedented total of a £7,200. In 1893, the year Utopia, Ltd. was produced, Princess Kailani of the independent monarchy of Hawaii attended a private school in England. She was the talk of the society pages, with much speculation as to the influence English civilization would have on the princess and eventually her homeland. Two decades earlier, in 1870, 
Anna Leon Owens first wrote about her six-year stint as governess to the children of the King of Siam and the English governess at the Siamese court. The two ladies in their stories are likely to have influenced the characters of Princess Zara and Lady Sophie, respectively. Another impetus for Gilbert in the genesis of the work was his disdain for England's Limited Liability Act of 1862, which he had begun to explore in the previous opera with Sullivan, The Gondoliers. By using an imaginary setting, Gilbert was emboldened to level some sharp satire at British imperialism, jingoism, the monarchy, party politics and other institutions that might have touched a more sensitive nerve if the opera had a British setting. In this work, Gilbert returns to the idea of an anti-utopia, which he had explored, in various ways, in his early one-act operas, Happy Arcadia, Our Island Home, Tepsichividom, and some of his other early works, especially The Happy Land. The previous Gilbert and Sullivan opera, The Gondoliers, also concerns an imaginary island kingdom where the rules of court are considerably different from those in Britain. In Utopia, the island begins as a virtual paradise, is thrown into chaos by the importation of English influences, and is eventually saved by an English political expedience. Gilbert's biographer Jane Stubman calls this a Gilbertian invasion plot. The opera's satiric treatment of limited liability entities that are not required to honor their obligations and scandal in the monarchy was effective in 1893 and still resonate today. In addition, the show satirizes practically everything English a Euro English prudery, English conversation, English company promoting, the English party system, the English War Office and Admiralty, the County Council, and the English Cabinet. Apart from satirical elements, in Utopia, Gilbert indulges in some small topical touches throughout the libretto. For instance, he was up to date in his technological references, by mentioning George Eastman's new product, the Kodak camera, and its slogan. Gilbert also throws some barbs at the Lord Chamberlain's office, as he loved to do. In addition, the court of St. James's is mockingly confused with St. James's Hall and its minstrel shows. Sullivan joins in the parody, underlining the mock praise of all things English with a repeated motif throughout the score based on the melody of Rule Britannia. Equals reception and aftermath equals the Savoy audiences were glad to see Gilbert and Sullivan back together, and the first night reception was rapturous. Sullivan wrote in his diary, went into the orchestra at 8.15 sharp. My ovation lasted 65 seconds. Peace went wonderfully well a year or not a hitch of any kind, and afterwards G and I had a double call. The critics were divided on the merits of the piece. Punch, habitually hostile to Gilbert, commented, limited it is, in more senses than one. The Standard, by contrast, said, Mr. Gilbert and Sir Arthur Sullivan are here at their very best a euro the wit, humor and satire of the book have not been surpassed in any of the author's previous operas, the composer's fascinating vein of melody flows as freshly as ever, and the orchestration is full of characteristically happy fancies a euro a more complete success has never been achieved in comic opera, even at the Savoy. The Paul Mal Gazette also praised Sullivan's contribution, but disparaged Gilbert's, in its view the music has not its equal in the whole Sullivan and Gilbert series, but the book had not merely a sense of cheapness but the sense of weariness even to exhaustion. The era commented that Gilbert's wit was as sparkling and his satire as keen as ever, and thought the council seemed screamingly funny. The observer judged that Gilbert had lost none of his merits, and that wit abounds, and is as spontaneous as ever, not forced or vulgarized, and his rhymes are always faultless. Some critics thought it a weakness that the work contained references to the earlier Gilbert and Sullivan operas, for example in the reuse of the character Captain Corcoran, and communications between King Paramount and the Mikado of Japan. The Paul Mal Gazette observed, It is always a melancholy business when a writer is driven to imitate himself. Utopia is a mirthless travesty of the work with which his name is most generally associated. Mr. Gilbert has failed to make the old seem new. The Musical Times reported the theatre-going public's rejoicing that the partners were reunited, but added, A. L. L. would have indulged in renewed jubilations had Utopia proved equal in humour and general freshness to the most successful of the companion works. This, unfortunately, cannot be said, although, 
of course, as compared with ordinary productions of the Opa copyright Ra Booth class it stands out sufficiently clear. Mr Gilbert could not put forward a silly or inane book, and Sir Arthur Sullivan could not pen music otherwise than refined, tuneful, and characterized by musicianly touches. It is only in comparison with such masterpieces of humor and dramatic and musical satire as Patience, the Mikado, the Yeoman of the Guard, and the Gondoliers that the libretto of Utopia seems a trifle dull, particularly in the first act, and the music for the most part reminiscent rather than fresh. The Daily News and The Globe both noted that act I ran longer than any previous Savoy opera and needed pruning. The Manchester Guardian praised the work, but commented that there was much Gilbertian dialogue. However, Gilbert and Sullivan's choices for what to cut are suspect. The Sopranos aria, Youth is a Boon of Al got some of the most enthusiastic reviews from the press but was cut after the opening night. The Globe called it one of Sir Arthur Sullivan's best works. Also, the pre-production cuts left subplots that were introduced in Act I unresolved. For example, Sullivan refused to set one of Gilbert's scenes for Nancy McIntosh, which left the Scafi Euro Fantiso Euro Zara subplot unresolved. Rutland Barrington, in his memoirs, felt that the second act was not as full of fun as usual in the Gilbert and Sullivan operas. The show made a modest profit despite the unusually high cost of staging it. In competition with the musical comedy's fashion pageantry, the drawing room scene was of an unprecedented opulence. The Manchester Guardian called it one of the most magnificent ever beheld on the stage, and even Punch praised the splendor of the production, but it added thousands of pounds of expense, making Utopia the most expensive of all of the Savoy operas. The taste of the London theatre-going public was shifting away from comic opera and towards musical comedies such as In Town, The Gaiety Girl and Morocco Bound, which were to dominate the London stage for the next two decades and beyond. Utopia introduced Gilbert's last proto-copyright gar copyright e, Nancy McIntosh, as Princess Zara, and the role was much expanded to accommodate her. According to the scholar John Wolfson, in his book, Final Curtain, this damaged and unbalanced the script by detracting from its parody of government. Commentators agree that Mackintosh was not a good actress, and during the run of Utopia, her lack of confidence and health combined to affect her performance. Utopia, Limited was to be Mackintosh's only part with the Doily Cart Opera Company, as Sullivan refused to write another piece if she was to take part in it. Discussions over her playing the role of Yum Yum in a proposed revival of the Mikado led to another row between the two that prevented the revival, and Gilbert's insistence upon her appearing in His Excellency caused Sullivan to refuse to set the piece. Three years passed before Gilbert and Sullivan collaborated again, on their last work, The Grand Duke. Equals production history equals, before the end of October, the title of the piece was changed from Utopia to Utopia, Limited. Utopia, Limited ran for 245 performances, a modest success by the standards of the late Victorian theatre. Although it was a shorter run than any of Gilbert and Sullivan's 1880s collaborations, it was the longest run at the Savoy in the 1890s. After the original production, four doily car touring companies played Utopia in the British provinces, and the piece was included in tours until 1900. There was also a doily cart production in New York in 1894, performances in the doily cart South African tour of 1902-03, and a J.C. Williamson production in Australia and New Zealand in 1905, managed by Henry Brassey. Rupert doily cart considered producing a revival in 1925, but the cost of the production was found to be too great, and the proposed revival was abandoned. Utopia was not revived by the Doily Cart Opera Company until April 4, 1975, during the company's centenary season, directed by Michael Heland. The performance was so oversubscribed that the company arranged to give four further performances at the Royal Festival Hall in London later that year. Various amateur companies performed the opera during the 20th century, and it has enjoyed occasional professional productions in the U.S. by professional companies such as the American Servo Yards in the 1950s and 1960s, the Light Opera of Manhattan in the 1970s and 1980s, 
Light Opera Works in Chicago in 1984 and Ohio Light Opera in 2001. The New York Gilbert and Sullivan Players also gave a staged concert performance in celebration of the opera's centenary and again in 2010. The Gilbert and Sullivan Opera Company gave two fully staged performances at the 18th International Gilbert and Sullivan Festival in Buxton, England in August 2011, producing a commercial video of the production. Although productions are still less frequent than those of the better-known Gilbert and Sullivan operas, and professional productions are rare, Utopia is regularly presented by some of the amateur Gilbert and Sullivan repertory companies, and an amateur production can be seen most summers at the International Gilbert and Sullivan Festival. Roles Utopians, King Paramount I, King of Utopia, Fantis, Scafio, Judges of the Utopian Supreme Court, Tarara, The Public Exploder, Kalinx, The Utopian Vice Chamberlain, The Princess Zara, Eldest Daughter of King Paramount, The Princess Nakia and The Princess Calibor, Her Younger Sisters, the Lady Sophie, their English Gouvernante, Salata, Meline, and Phila, Utopian Maidens, Imported Flowers of Progress, Lord Dromelli, a British Lord Chamberlain, Captain Fitzbat Leakes, First Lifeguards, Captain Sir Edward Corcoran, KCB, of the Royal Navy Mr. Goldbury, a company promoter, afterwards Comptroller of the Utopian Household, Sir Bailey Barr, QC, MP Mr. Blushington, of the County. Council. Synopsis. Equals act I equals. On the fictional South Pacific island of Utopia, the monarch, King Paramount, has sent his eldest daughter, Princess Zara, to Girton College in England. He hopes that her training there will contribute to his plan to civilize his people. The public exploder, Tarara, disturbs the languor of the Utopian maidens to remind them of his duty to blow up the king of the two wise men. Scafio and Fantis, order him to do so. The wise men appear, heralded by the chorus and note that their duty is to spy upon the king to prevent rascality. Fantis proclaims his love for the princess Zara, and Scafio promises to help him win her. The king arrives and presents his two younger daughters, Nakia and Calibor, as models of English-style deportment. Their English governess, Lady Sophie explains how young ladies should behave when approached by amorous gentlemen. The king joins the two wise men, commenting that life is a farce. The king is quite upset about the wise men's power over him, he is unable to marry the Lady Sophie because of self-mocking articles that Scafio and Fantis have forced him to write and publish in the newspaper under a pseudonym. He hopes that neither Sophie nor Zara will see the pieces, although he feels they are witty and well-written. Lady Sophie discovers the articles to her horror. Princess Zara now returns to Utopia with six British gentlemen in tow. She has become romantically involved with one of them, Captain Fitzbat Leakes. Scafio and Fantis, seeing her, are both smitten with love for the princess and argue jealously, finally agreeing to duel one another for her hand. Fitzbat Leakes comes up with a clever way to stall the wise men, by saying that, in England, Two rivals must entrust the lady at the center of a controversy to an officer of household cavalry as stakeholder until the argument is resolved. Thus, he and Zara can remain together. Soon, the Utopians assemble, and Zara introduces the flowers of progress one by one a Euro Fitzbat Leakes, Sir Bailey Barr, Lord Dromelli, Mr. Blushington, Mr. Goldbury and Captain Corcoran. The Utopian people are duly impressed and they listen as each of the flowers of progress gives a piece of advice about how to improve the country. Mr. Goldbury explains, at some length, the British Limited Liability Company's law. The king decides to transform his entire country into a limited liability corporation a euro an innovation that even England herself has not yet accepted. Everyone but Scafio, Fantis and Tarara is enthusiastic. Equals Act 2 equals. Fitzbat Leakes is concerned that the fervor of his love has affected his singing voice. He and Zara share a tender scene. Utopia has transformed itself into a more perfect replica of Britain a Euro it has built an army, a navy, and courts, purified its literature and drama, and wholeheartedly adopted Mr. Goldborough's proposal, so that every person now is a limited liability entity. 
the king and the flowers of progress exult in their success, and the people, pleased with English fashions and customs, sing of the country's newfound glory. Scafio and Fantis are furious because the change poses a threat to their power. They demand that Paramount revoke the changes, and when he refuses, they remind him of their power over his life. But the king points out that they cannot blow up a limited company. Scafio and Fantis plot with Tarara on how to reverse the course of events and retire. The younger princesses, Nakia and Calibor, meet Mr. Goldberry and Lord Dramelli, who explain that English girls are not so demure and are instead hearty and fun-loving. The princesses are pleased at the prospect of abandoning some of the musty, fusty rules that they have been living under. Meanwhile, Lady Sophie bemoans Paramount's flaw that prevents her loving him. The king, his dignity rediscovered, approaches Lady Sophie and tells her the truth about the articles written about him, and she now happily agrees to marry him. Scafio and Fantis, however, have succeeded in convincing the people of Utopia that the changes are for the worse. For example, there has been an end to war, making the army and navy useless. Sanitation is so good that the doctors are unemployed. And so perfect are the laws that crime has all but ended, emptying the courts and leaving lawyers jobless. The people demand that the changes be revoked. Paramount asks his daughter for a solution, and, after a little prodding from Sir Bailey Barr, she realizes that she has forgotten the most essential element of British civilization, government by party. Under the two-party system, each party will so confound the efforts of the other that no progress will be made, leading to the happy result that everyone seeks. The crowd is overjoyed, Scafio and Fantis are thrown in prison, and the curtain falls as the people sing their praises of a little group of isles beyond the wave of Euro Great Britain. Musical Numbers, Introduction 1, Act I. 1. In lazy languor motionless, 2. O oh, make way for the wise men, 2a. In every mental law, 3. Let all your doubts take wing, 4. Quaff the nectar, 4a. A king of autocratic power we, 4b. Although of native maids the cream, 4c. Bold-faced ranger, 5. First you're born, 6. Subjected to your heavenly gaze, 7. O, oh, maiden rich in girt and law, 8. Ah. Gallant soldier, 9. It's understood, I think, 10. O, oh, admirable art, 11. Cut song for Zara, youth is a boon avowed, sung on the first night but now lost. 12. Act I finale, although your royal summons to appear, and, when Britain sounds the trump of war, 12a. What these may be, and a company promoter this, 12b. I'm Captain Corcoran. KCB, and E. Wandres from a mighty state, 12C. Some seven men form an association, well, at first sight it strikes us as dishonest, and hence forward of a verity, Act 2, 13. O, oh, Zara. And A. Tenor, all singers above, 14. Words of love too loudly spoken, 15. Society has quite forsaken, 16. Entrance of court, 17. Drawing room music, 18. This ceremonial, eagle high and cloudland soaring, 19. With fury deep we burn, 20. If you think that when banded in unity, 21. With wily brain, 22. A wonderful joy our eyes to bless, 23. Then I may sing and play, 24. Oh, with some demon pow, when but a maid of fifteen year. 25. Ah, Lady Sophie, then you love me. 25a. Oh, rapture unrestrained, 25b. Tarantella, 26. Upon our sea girt land, 27. Finale Act 2, there's a little group of isles beyond the wave, one on the 1976 recording, the Doily Cart Opera Company preceded the introduction with Sullivan's Imperial March, which he composed around the same time. Historical cast information, the opening night principal cast and 1975 centenary cast were as follows. Recordings, 
The first recording was issued in 1964 featuring the Amateur Lyric Theatre Company of Washington, D.C. conducted by John Landis. The first complete professional recording was made in 1976 by the Doily Cart Opera Company, conducted by Royston Nash, variously considered a somewhat flat and uninspired account of the score, or to have a sparkle and spontaneity that are irresistible. The critic Andrew Lamb wrote, There is a suggestion of stodginess in the conducting a Euro but the singing displays the dependability that is the Doily Cart Company's chief virtue. Kenneth Sengford is outstanding as King Paramount. Also available is a 2001 Ohio Light Opera set, of which Opera News wrote, conducted with verve by J. Lynn Thompson and featuring a generally strong cast, it serves the musical values of Utopia well. The principals sing with fine style and admirable diction. Unlike the doily cart recording the later set has dialogue, though Opera News considered that some performers lack dramatic variety in the spoken dialogue. Notes. References. Einer, Michael. Gilbert and Sullivan, A Dual Biography. Oxford, Oxford University Press. ISBN 0195147693. Allen, Reginald. The First Night Gilbert and Sullivan. New York, The Heritage Press. OCLC 749296966. Bailey, Leslie. The Gilbert and Sullivan Book. London, Spring Books. OCLC 3651931. Bradley, Ian. The Complete Annotated Gilbert and Sullivan. Oxford, England, Oxford University Press. ISBN 0198165036X. Brown, Edith A. Stars of the Stage, W. S. Gilbert. London, John Lane. The Bodley Head. OCLC 5,866,733. Celia, Frenner Section Noir and Cunningham Bridgman. Gilbert and Sullivan and Their Operas. London, Sir Isaac Pittman and Sons, Ltd. OCLC 58,942,004. Graham, Bruce, From Bambalite to Utopia, Often Backs Whittington as a Possible Source for Utopia. Limited and the Gaiety, Spring 2006, pages 23 Euro 27. Editor, Roderick Murray. March, Ivan. The Penguin Guide to Recorded Classical Music. London, Penguin Books. ISBN 9780141033365. Rollins, Cyril. R. John Witts. The Doily Cart Opera Company and Gilbert and Sullivan Operas, A Record of Productions, 1875 a Euro 1961. London, Michael Joseph. OCLC 1317843. Also, five supplements, privately printed. Shaw, Bernard. Dan H. Lawrence, ed. Shaw's Music a Euro The Complete Music Criticism of Bernard Shaw. Volume 2. London, The Bodley Head. ISBN 0370312716. Wilson, Robin. Frederick Lloyd. Gilbert and Sullivan, The Official Doily Cart Picture History. New York, Alfred A. North. ISBN 0394541138. Wolfson, John. Final Curtain, The Last Gilbert and Sullivan Operas. London, Chapel in association with A. Deutsch. ISBN 0903443120. External links, Utopia Limited at the Gilbert and Sullivan Archive, Utopia Limited at the Gilbert and Sullivan Discography, Utopia Review, Article on Utopia and Gilbert's Satire of Corporation Law, Article about Utopia, Limited, 1893 Review of Utopia, Limited in the Musical Times, Biographies of the people listed in the cast lists, Bab illustrations of lyrics from Utopia.